Okay, class, welcome back. In this final part of our lecture, we're going to cover lines that you may encounter in acute care. Again, we covered basics of line management and principles we need to be aware of in our acute care basics. And then we had that great video from Dr. Bento on things that you might encounter and what they look like and where they may be located and how to position them. Uh, this will go over just kind of what these are. So this will be a pretty quick review because we covered some of these core elements. But um, you know, in the acute care setting, you know, you, especially in the ICU, you may encounter a situation like this where we've got multiple lines hooked up. We've got a couple uh, different infusion pumps. We've got a couple different A-lines. we got a vent kind of going on here. we got uh, these are A-line with that pressure balloon. We've got patients on a vent. So, you know, managing these things, right, um, is something of the utmost important in order to, importance to keep this patient safe while we're working with them, right? Um, and historically, like, you know, patients on multiple lines didn't get care, but we're more, learning more and more that, like, well, we can manage these things, you know, and, and in order uh, to allow the patient to be active and to prevent some of the complications from uh, bed rest, um, you know, in a, and the inactivity that can, can compound the whatever condition it came in for. So, you know, being able to manage these lines has been something that's been a huge, huge benefit to uh, not only our profession, but most importantly, our patients. So the most basic line that you'll encounter is a peripheral IV. You'll see this referred to as PIV, peripheral IV. It's inserted, obviously, into a peripheral vein, uh, most often the radial or brachial. Um, it's used for delivery of medications or blood, um, fluid. It's easily mobile, can be capped. Um, it's not super critical if it's dislodged. If it's dislodged, you're going to apply pressure, you know, maybe elevate the arm, depending on, you know, your facility guidelines. Um, and then probably the most important thing, if it happens, inform the RN. Since it's in the vein, you know, typically not a life-threatening situation, but you definitely want to make sure we stop the bleeding and we close that site up so they don't get uh, an infection. Now, on the other hand, an arterial line, an A-line, is uh, a very critical situation because this is inserted into, as you can guess, an artery. Uh, you may often see it inserted into the uh, radial or femoral. This may even be sutured in place sometimes just to keep it really um, secure. We see here it's kind of secured by uh, multiple layers of tape. Um, if this gets dislodged, it is a medical emergency, right? Because we're in an artery, right? It's going to bleed a lot more, um, uh, a lot more than a, a vein, right? And, and, a, and a much higher pressure. Um, there may be some mobility restrictions in the past that people had. People had a femoral line that you know exercise may have been contraindicated or at least to that limb. That's kind of changed now, and that comes from a lot of the work uh, that people have done in our profession, some excellent work that supports that if it's managed appropriately, depending on the patient's characteristics, how long the line has been in, it, it might be appropriate to mobilize that patient, right? So again, things have evolved quite substantially over the really past 10, 20 years, and managing patients with A-lines is a big one. Um, these medications will, or, sorry, these lines will be used to manage uh, uh uh, directly monitor arterial blood pressure, as well as maybe to draw blood gases. You may see this in a patient who came in potentially with um, some sort of uh, respiratory issue or he someone who needs hemodynamic monitoring. Um, a central venous catheter, or CVC, um, is a catheter that's placed directly into a large vein, often the internal jugular vein um, or subclavian vein, usually has a uh, little port leads, which you can see emanating out of the vein. This is used to administer medication sometimes, often to uh, measure uh, the central venous oxygen saturation as well as central venous pressure, so we can get a reflection of ventricular pressures and function. Um, again, primarily used to, it's primarily as a monitor to look at, again, uh, you know, the cardiac function in, in the heart. And then we have a PIC line. So a PIC line um, is the only central line that's typically inserted by a nurse. There may be different institutional policies. This is basically, you can think of it as a long-term uh, catheter access for uh, medication. Maybe someone's on some sort of infusion or some other sort of um, you know, long-term you know, therapy that could be, needs to be administered through you know, in, in intravenous um, placement. So they'll use a PIC line. Typically, there's not many issues with mobility. The patients can get up because it's typically going to be inserted into an upper arm. Um, just be mindful, again, just always, you know, talk with uh, the nurse, you know, nurse or the person managing that line or ordering that line, just because, you know, you may need, there may be some restrictions on the mobility of the specific joint 
uh, that it's it's passing through. So the shoulder, you probably don't want to be lifting it in most places you know, too high up or lifting or carrying anything too heavily in the, the arm or limb where that's inserted. Now, the pulmonary artery catheterization um, line or PA line, also known as the swan gan, some people say this is kind of the, 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 pen, or the, the ultimate line, right? So it gives us a reading of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which looks at kind of an indirect measurement of left end, uh, left end diastolic function. So looking at function of the left heart through function by looking at the pulmonary capillary pressure. Basically, if we see a really high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, it means there's backflow, meaning there may be some issue with, lead, with ventricular function. Uh, this you'll see, and you'll be able to recognize it because of the three ports that kind of um, stick out, as well as uh, where it's placed, because it'll be kind of right, you know, to the top of their, of their shoulder and on the left side. This is a life-threatening situation if this gets dislodged. It is almost always sutured in place. Typically, you will also have these little um, stitches um, or little uh, marks, rather, on the on the Swangans line to give you an idea of where it was, uh, how deep it was in. You need to keep track of how many stitches you see because if you see more those little marks on the line once the patient you know comes back to bed or finishes therapy or during therapy. That means that thing has moved, right? And again, if it gets dislodged or if it's unstable, that could be a life-threatening situation. So um, patients may be on bed rest temporarily when it's placed just to make sure everything's okay, um, but typically okay to mobilize again with clearance. So just be careful with this one. Again, be, be mindful of those little markers on the line and they should be the same as they are when you first met the patient as they are when you return and, and finish with the patient. The next line you'll often encounter again is patient controlled anesthesia or PCA. You'll see these throughout the hospital. Um, this may be different now, you know, depending on the facility on their, on their recommendations and policy towards opiate management. These are typically given to give patients some sort of general anesthesia, narcotics to help uh, manage their pain. The great thing is with these, the patient can kind of control the amount of uh, pain relieving medications that they need. Um, and it cycles every 15 minutes. The idea is that you're giving them good pain control um, versus having to you know, rely on you know, nursing staff and, and rotations and stuff to get meds out. The patient can kind of manage it themselves. Um, you know, if you're working with a patient you know, with this, maybe it's a good idea to, if they have a green light, uh, you know, so this, will, this little button here will turn on once it's ready to deliver its dose. Have the patient click it before you start your therapy session and get, you know, kind of get the medications kind of uh, going, uh, but not always, not always needed. The key thing is only the patient is allowed to press the button, right? Only the patient is allowed to press it. You aren't allowed to press it, um, and neither is a family member allowed to press it. It has to be the patient. This is also mobile, can be clamped, again, because it can be a little bit cumbersome. It's a pretty big little, you know, um, uh, manifold here. Again, always ask to, ask the nurse if that's an appropriate thing that can be clamped. Another thing that you encounter frequently are chest tubes. Again, chest tubes are uh, inserted into lungs or the, the mediastinal space, portal space to drain um, blood, fluid, or air. So someone who had a pneumothorax, we can use this potentially to reinflate the lung, uh, pleural fusion, or even post-op surgery because they'll have a little bit of blood, a little bit of drainage. This just helps facilitate that drainage. Now, typically these patients um, in the first few days may be under a wall suction, which means they have you know, external pressure from a, like a vac that is helping create that negative pressure to drain the lung. Um, usually after maybe a couple days, they may be put on what we call water seal, meaning that they don't need to be on external suction. Um, the, the, probably the biggest thing is you need to make sure that uh, the patient, these, this always, 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 right, needs to stay upright. You don't wanna see this on the ground. This have these little, these little things here to keep it upright too, to balance. And you should try to keep them below the patient, right? Just so that they drain, right? Because we lift it up like it's going to, you know, drain back in and defeat the purpose. They can be very uncomfortable too because I think we're putting tubing up into an area that doesn't have a lot of space. Um, so just be mindful of that. Maybe teach them some of those pain relieving techniques we, we've, we've covered. Um, the great thing is too, ambulation mobility facilitates drainage of the lungs. So an often a talking point to our patients or, or leverage points say, hey, like, I know these are uncomfortable, but if you work with me, it actually may help drainage. Maybe you'll be able to get these things out 
a little bit sooner rather than later. And the, often the first time someone stands up after maybe a cardiac or thoracic surgery, you, you get a little bit of drainage um, into those ports. So again, uh, just be mindful of that. Um, and if they're over full and like you end up seeing like a lot of tube, a lot of fl a fluid back up that's not draining into the receptacle, just make sure you let the nurse uh, aware because they may cycle that back out. And, and don't do that by yourself with that, without asking first and, let, and unless you're trained. Uh, Jackson Pratt drains, these are for uh, smaller um, surgeries that have a little bit of drainage. Again, maybe if you have um, you know, um, a, a small little operation on the neck or somewhere else, we'll use an external drain to help, again, facilitate drainage out of uh, that area. Um, and another line that you may encounter as well in the inpatient setting is an intra-aortic balloon pump. Again, we cover this in our um, hemodynamic assist devices or circulatory assist devices. Basically, the way this operates is it helps facilitate um, pumping out of the, the heart by reducing afterload because basically we have a balloon that inflates, de deflates immediately right before contraction to kind of create a negative pressure to help draw blood out of the heart. And then diastole, it stays inflated, which helps, you know, push blood back up into the primary, uh, you know, the, the primary branches, as well as back into our ostia to help, uh, you know, fuel the heart. So, um, or perfuse the heart. So we find this is a way to help not only decrease demand on the heart, but also maybe help increase uh, myocardial uh, oxygen or, or blood supply. So we often see some patients with um, uh, uh, severe critically, critical illness and acute heart failure um, that really need you know, assistance from a mechanical device to kind of keep the heart working. Uh, these used to be a contraindication to mobility. There is some new research now that supports that, again, depending on the, on the case, this may, the patient may be you know, able to mobilize in a limited fashion. So again, work with your, your, the medical team managing that patient to see if there's something that we can do for them while they're on it, if they're stable enough. Uh, temporary epicardial pacers, again, we talked about this earlier on. These are done, um, these are used to help keep the heart in rhythm right, um, after a cardiac event or surgery, like a cabbage or a valve replacement even. Again, because when we operate in the heart, it gets irritable. This just helps keep it paced during that period. Typically, when this gets removed, it is the only the time we get really super concerned about it um, or initial placement, just because we want to make sure the heart, like, doesn't do anything funny after we place or remove it, and the patient may be um, bed, bed bound during those periods. So again, timing everything you have in the hospital is super important. This removal of the, of the pacer wires and placement of pacer wires is a big one. Uh, the next one we'll, we'll touch on is again, the NG tube. Uh, you'll see this as well. This can be used for feeding or for suction. Um, you'll often see this post abdominal surgery, um, um, or sorry, abdominal and abdominal trauma, post just general trauma, and maybe even post cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, it's pretty easily mobile. It needs to be capped before movement. Again, always checking with the nurse before just doing that cavalierly. And there's usually something that keeps it in place as well. So just be, be mindful of that. It can be a little bit uncomfortable for patients as well too. So just be, be aware of that as well. And the last thing we'll touch on is a Foley catheter. Uh, these are used to drain urine typically for patients that have high urine output that maybe not uh, possess the mobility to get to the bathroom reliably. Um, you know, so if they, you know, people with a high urine output that have poor mobility, you know, if they can't get out of bed, we'll have an issue with, with um, you know, urinating upon themselves um, or soiling themselves. So um, to prevent that, we'll use a catheter. And they'll typically, they'll monitor the amount of drainage um, before adjusting it. Now, there's a version called this, uh, of this called the condom catheter, um, which does not insert into the urethra. Um, you see, uh, uh, you know, the Depending on facilities, some are moving more to that variety if they can. Uh, the Foley catheter is pretty stable, though. So for patients that, again, have a high urine output uh, that or are completely immobile, you, you may see the Foley catheter. Again, big thing with this, if it's full, if you see, like, fluid back up into the tubing here um, or this is overly heavy, um, you, you know, they may drain it. Don't drain it, though, without checking with the nurse because they're, again, typically tracking the output in the, um, from this, again, to determine whether or not it's gonna come out or, or not. So that's all the lines we're gonna cover. Again, that's just the basics. There are so many different and new lines you see on floors, uh, but this is the entry, you know, we're, we're getting you guys prepared for entry-level practice. 
So we want to cover the things you'll, you'll most most likely encounter from uh, an acute care setting. So hopefully this, these lectures were useful to you guys. You guys feel a little bit more prepared to managing uh, these patients in this setting. Thank you so much.